well, after John Frances' presentation, we have obtained a network using the different uh, connectivity metrics that he has explained. And I am going to explain briefly how to analyze these brain networks, and particularly using graph parameters derived from complex graph theory. First, I'm going to do a brief introduction of what is a network, the different types of networks, and different networks that we can find in the brain, and analysis uh, depending on the disease that we are going to analyze. analyze. Then I will explain briefly some graph theory parameters, uh, the basic concept annotations, the neural the network measures and its implications, and a procedure to normalize them that is known as surrogation. The classical uh, EEG network analysis is divided into frequency networks, so we obtain one network per frequency uh, per frequency band. So this is very complex to analyze this from the clinical point of view. So uh, in recent years, it uh, appears a new approach that is known as multilayer or multiplex networks. And I'm going to show you different ways ways to build these networks. Fourthly, I'm going to explain uh, some basis on network modeling, some uh, attacks to the network and to study how it reacts and how it evolves uh, on time. And finally, I'm going to show you some examples on different brain diseases and its modifications in the network. For example, Alzheimer's disease and this prodromal phase that is known as mid-cognitive impairment and schizophrenia. So, what is a network? A network is just a mathematical representation of a real uh, world complex system. And in this point, the brain is known as the more complex system in the human brain, in the human body. A network is defined by a set of nodes that can represent different brain networks. For example, in the case of fMRI, the different parcellations, or in the case of EEG, the different electrodes. And it's also defined by the links between these nodes that represent the connectivity that the Frances have just told you before. For example, in the image, we can see a simple network with four nodes and five links between them. When there is no link between the nodes, uh, there is no connection at all between them. And all networks are represented by their agency or connectivity or coupling matrices, where rows denote the nodes and the matrices entries represent the value of the links. So, for example, uh, in this point, uh, 0. Point is the connectivity between the node, uh, the first node, and the second node, and so on for the rest for the of the comparisons. Depending on the weight of the links, we can distinguish two different types of networks. Uh, on one hand, binary networks, that the connectivity is just one or zero, and denote the presence or absence of connection. And weighted networks, where links have information about the connection strength, and it's just a number between zero and one, where one values close to one represent a high uh, connectivity, and values close to zero are representing a low connectivity, a lower coupling. And it can be also uh, two different types of networks based on the directionality of the links. Directed networks that are obtained using Granger causality or these measures that Jan Francesca has explained, and undirected networks that are symmetric attention matrices that are obtained using functional connectivity measures. In this diagram of the image, we can see that we can have one matrix and doing different permutation or mathematical operation very simple, like binarize, symmetrize, or thresholding, we can go from one type of network to another one. 
And in this point, I need your participation. Which type of network do you think is that one in the image? Any idea? Uh, yes. Weighted? Yes. Uh, weighted, non-directional. And directed or undirected? I would. Undirected. Yeah, you are right. It's weighted and undirected because it, the matrix is symmetric and there are values different than one or zero and representing the strength of the connection. So, well, in the brain, we can different different uh, networks that control the brain function uh, during task or while rest. Particularly, seven large scale brain networks have been identified depending on the purpose or what is doing the brain in each particular moment. The first one is the known as the sensory motor network, thus control feeling, auditory and motor functions. The second one is known as the default mode network and is the responsible for internal processing and is active during sleep, during rest and sleep. It's very common to study this network, for example, in diseases like schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease, because this network is altered due to the changes in the brain due to these diseases. The silent network that monitors and dec decides how other networks react to new info. The limbic system, that is the responsible of the regulation of motion, motivation and memory, which is also altered in during Alzheimer's disease, because it's affected to the memory. The dorsal attention network that holds attention for externally directed tasks. The central executive network that is responsible for active tasks and decision making. And finally, the visual system that controls visual processing, as is known as. Depending on what we're going to study or what we're going to see in the brain, we can study only this. Uh, networks in terms of the whole brain networks. Well, I'm going to explain now uh, the basis of the graph theory parameters and starting uh, that what is a graph theory parameter? So it's a, a value or a number that may characterize one or several aspects of the whole network. It, ca it can be global or local brain connectivity. So basic concept annotations. You can see in this slide, more or less capital N is the set of all networks. Um, N is just the number of head nodes and so on. Don't worry about it because uh, all this information is available in this paper. And I'm going to show you some equation for each parameter, but the thing that I'm going to explain you in this presentation is the clinical or the implications in the in the net in the network connectivity of the variation of each parameter. For example, if this parameter is higher, the net is going to be uh, more segregated, for example. So just don't worry about the mathematical equations. Well, there are four different type of theory graph parameters. The first one are based on measures of centrality. That is based on the node degree. That is just the sum of all connections of each node. And quantify uh, the average connectivity of the network or the total wiring cost. Measures of functional integration that are based on the sorted path lengths that I'm going to talk about before, uh, the after and quantify the ability to combine specialized information from distant brain regions, so global connectivity. Measures of functional segregations that are based on the presence of absence of triangles or the probability of one neighbor or one not neighbor to be a neighbor of, of others neighbors. And uh, uh, so the presence of hubs of uh, information processing in the in the network. So it's local connectivity. And finally, measures of resilience that 
quantify the plasticity or the availability or the ability of the network to react when a node is affected or a pathway is affected. Among the measures of centrality, uh, the most simple is the global strength, that is just the average of the node degree. So it's going to give us an idea of how connected in average is our network. The closeness centrality, more or less, the idea is the same. And the betweenness centrality. Uh, the betweenness centrality, particularly uh, when a red node is connected to networks that are highly connected among them. So the nodes of one network are highly connected and other network is highly connected. We are going to uh, reach a higher value of betweenness centrality. Among the measures of functional integration, we have two characteristic path length and global efficiency. Note that here is not the weight of the network, is the distance of the network that is mathematically, conceptually, is an inverse of the weight. So if the, the network is highly connected, the distance is going to be low and the characteristic path length is going to be lower. Uh, in the case of global, global efficiency, sorry, uh, there is the inverse of the distance. So highly connected networks are going to have a higher value for global efficiency. Measures of functional segregation, the clustering coefficient and transitivity. And when a greater number of connections in each model, for example, in this network, we have two models. And if the models are highly connected, the nodes of each uh, subnetwork or model are connected between each other, we are going to have a high value of cluster coefficient and also for transitivity. And modularity, uh, if, we, if these two models are connected by just one or a few uh, nodes or links, we are going to have a higher modularity uh, compared to when the modules are connected by more nodes or links, for example, on the right. The measures of resilience, uh, it's known that overload dist degree distributions uh, may be resilient to gradual random deterioration, but are highly vulnerable if the nodes that are highly connected to other nodes are affected. So the degree distribution is important is important when we are measuring resilience of the network. And the associativity coefficient, uh, if we have many connections when uh, between two nodes, two modules, sorry, we are going to have a higher value of associativity. And if we have only just one link, if this link is affected, the associativity is lower because the network is going to be disconnected one end to the other end. Well, a well-designed anatomical network will combine uh, the presence of information hubs that are specialized in one function, so in segregated network, and these models uh, should have a great or a robust number of intermodular links that connect each other. So small world networks are highly segregated, but also integrated. In the example of the image, we can see that a regular network is less random than a small world network, but the random network has uh, less organization in the network. So in this point, uh, there is a, another parameter that is known as small world. that is compute as the division uh, of the clustering coefficient, normalize it, and the normalized path length. Oh, we have to normalize the, these metrics because by definition, all the metrics that I have explained uh, depend on the weight of the network, so the connectivity of the network, but also on the network side. If we have a network with just uh, 19 electrodes, it's going to have probably uh, 
a lower value of these parameters compared to if we have 60, 64 electrodes. So to obtain measures that are independent of the network size, we have to perform a randomization procedure. Uh, this randomization is based on resolving the edge weight, but preserving the basic characteristic of the original network, that is size, density, and degree distribution. This procedure has to be done at least 50 or more times, and we obtain uh, new values for these parameters. We uh, average among between among between between 50 between these 50 random networks and obtain the this parameter ratio by dividing by dividing the original value and the mean value of the random graphs. The classical approach uh, is based on single trial, so we have five second or one second trial. Well, firstly, we pre-process the signal. You see this the first day of the workshop. We filter into the classical EEG frequency bands. We estimate the connectivity using one of the metrics that John Francis has explained us. And in, it's important to estimate uh, connectivity in short time trials because um, some of the metrics require stationarity or pseudo-stationarity of the signal and the EEG is natural non, a non-stationary signal. And then finally, once we have built the network, we compute the graph parameters for each trial and each frequency band. And finally, we average all trials to obtain one value for frequency band and per subject. So, if we have one network for each frequency band, uh, it can lead to obtain uh, results that can be in different directions. And it will be very difficult to interpret for from the clinical point of view. So in this point, in recent years, multi-layer or multiplex network approach have been focused uh, a great attention. So we have the network for different frequency bands, for example, this frequency, these three frequency bands. And we have to uh, merge all the information in these three frequency bands to obtain just one network that combines all the information available <coughs> in the three frequency bands. But usually the interlayer links that are plotted in, in red in the image are not available. So different methods have been proposed to build this multiplex network from the simple sum across all the frequency bands to more complex approaches as cross-frequency coupling or canonical cor correlation analysis. The pro of this uh, approach is that this network, we have only one network per subject, so it's going to be easier to interpret from the clinical point of view, but uh, these approaches could compensate opposite trends between groups. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, it's known that in low frequency bands, there are increases in connectivity, but in high frequency bands, there are decreases in connectivity. So we, if we sum these parameters, uh, it's going to compensate this trend, and it's going the differences between groups are going to be blurred. So um, finally, I'm going to explain a brief introduction into network modeling. That is the simulation uh, of attacks to the networks and the study of the evolution of the network in terms of robustness. For example, with the aim of reflecting the main neurodegenerative mechanism on Alzheimer's disease, or if we going if we want to reflect the effects of uh, schizophrenia in, in, in terms of networks, network analysis. Well, uh, network modeling is based on select one node 
for one link that is on also a pathway. And in the case of the, if we want to reflect the neural generative mechanism, uh, we select one node or one pathway and divide the link or the connectivity of the node by two. And there are different ways of selecting a node, primary, secondary, and random attack, depending on what node is going to be selected. In the primary attack, higher degree nodes are selected more probably. In the secondary node attack, the low degrees nodes. And in random, the node is selected randomly. Analogously, uh, we can attack a pathway in the same way, with a primary, with a secondary, and a, with a random attack. And let's see some examples in the literature. But firstly, I'm going to do like, just like some questions that you can raise your hand if you think that the cluster coefficient uh, increase or decrease during Alzheimer's disease. But, but uh, before that, I'm going to give you some hints of what happens in Alzheimer's disease and mid cognitive impairment. Well, firstly, Alzheimer's disease is known as a disconnection system syndrome, sorry, and there are decreases in connectivity in high frequency bands uh, from alpha to higher frequency bands. And in the image, we can see a network of a healthy control and a network of representing the connectivity of the network of Alzheimer's disease and MCI. So please raise your hand those who think that the cluster coefficient, so the presence of halves of the number of triangles, increases during Alzheimer's disease. No one? So I suppose that all of you think that the cluster coefficient decreases during Alzheimer's disease. So raise, please raise your hand, those who think that cluster coefficient decrease during Alzheimer's disease. Those that are not raising your hand, you don't have an opinion, you just a guess. <laughs> so, yes, you're right. The cluster coefficient decrease during Alzheimer's disease in high frequency bands. There are less triangles, there are, there are less in nodes connected to a high number of of nodes, so suggesting that there are less uh, in, information hubs, information processing hubs, and the same for <coughs> sorry, the same for characteristic path length. So it's so yeah, I remember that the characteristic path length uh, is an integration measure. It, it takes uh, the information to uh, go from one end to the other end of the network. So highly connected networks have lower characteristic file length and uh, highly connected networks, and sorry, uh, lower connected networks has, has highly uh, characteristic file length. So what do you think about characteristic file length? It's going to be higher in Alzheimer's disease? You are right. <laughs> and as that is, uh, is less connected, so it's less uh, the network is less integrated in Alzheimer's disease. So the small wall computed as the cluster coefficient divided by the normalized Cartesian part length. If the cluster coefficient goes uh, decrease and the Cartesian part length uh, increases, the small wall is going to be lower and the networks are going to be more vulnerable vulnerable uh, to attacks or to failures. The case of schizophrenia. Uh, in this case, uh, schizophrenia is known as a, dis a brain disease that is characterized by the uh, hypersetability of brain neurotransmitters, for example, GABA, and there are increases in connectivity baseline but there is low, less connectivity in response after an stimuli. For example, P300 or TMS. So what is going to happen to the 
clustering coefficient in schizophrenia in baseline and in response. Increase in, ba in baseline and in response. Increase also. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, you were right. <laughs> Then the, uh, the cluster coefficient is going to increase in baseline and the cluster coefficient is going to decrease in response. There are a lot of more triangles and, for example, this node is highly connected to others. So this, for example, is going to be a uh, half of information processing. And the path length? The opposite trend. So the opposite trend. And the small world is, is very easy to think that it's going to increase in baseline but decrease in response. So this uh, table reflects that if the network in schizophrenia in baseline is more connected and in response is less connected, uh, we can uh, inf infer that uh, the response to the stimul to the stimulus is different for healthy controls compared to schizophrenia. And in this point, it's very important to talk about brain plasticity. So the brain of healthy controls uh, has higher brain plasticity, so reacts uh, more compared to schizophrenia. And now we are going to see a particular uh, studies in the literature that show these uh, trends. Firstly, uh, an EG study of Alzheimer's disease uh, and mild cognitive impairment of 2019 that uh, uses uh, EG resting state signals, uh, the single trial procedure, and they divide the old EG signal in one second trials. As connectivity measure, they use the phase coherence, that is a bit different, uh, has some differences with coherence, but it's more or less the same, but only taking into account the phase information. So they obtain uh, connectivity matrices that form weighted and undirected graphs, and they, they compute the clustering coefficient and global efficiency. And the results uh, in the alpha band, they show a significant decrease in clustering coefficient and significant decreases too of the global efficiency that are related to the uh, increases of characteristic path length. In this image, we can see the topological distribution of these measures, and we can see also the decrease of cluster coefficient uh, during the continuum of the of the disease, from the mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease. Sever. More or less another uh, EG study, but now with schizophrenia. And now they use an auditory Othbal uh, paradigm that we expected to obtain a P300 uh, peak in the EEG. <clears throat> and they do a single trial with one second uh, duration trials. The connectivity is estimated using event-related coherence from uh, the information available in the continuous wavelength transport. So they do not uh, compute the connectivity using the signals. They do a time frequency transformation and they compute the, the connectivity using this transformation. And they compute the typical metrics, but uh, all are normalized, normalized using the 50 surrogate networks. <coughs> uh, in the results, we can see uh, on the on the on the left top we can see that in baseline more or less it's just the the same connectivity 
but there are uh, statistical differences when compare controls to all the group of schizophrenia patients. But in response, uh, these differences are uh, more significant. We can see that controls uh, present higher values of cluster coefficient and the patient has less uh, values for this measure. And in the bottom image, uh, the correlated samples t test uh, talk about uh, how the network reacts to the stimuli. And we can see that in the case of controls, there is a big plasticity of the brain because there are a lot of significant differences. But in the case of the schizophrenia patients, the networks remain more or less uh, with no difference, just three uh, electrodes. So uh, there is more segregated cortical activity in the baseline, so by the higher clustering coefficient values, less segregated cortical activity in response uh, for patients. So uh, the cognitive capacity for patients is uh, lower because for this purpose, larger integration activity uh, is needed. Another uh, study uh, of schizophrenia, but now using fMRI signals. They use resting state fMRI, the tractography and the parcellation of the brain, uh, of the brain regions. They compute the connectivity as the number of streamlines between the corresponding brain regions, but adjusting them uh, by the fiber length and and then apply a threshold and they compute different metrics that the normalize cluster coefficient, modularity, path length, and small wellness. And the results they obtain, we can see higher segregation in schizophrenia, revealed by the higher values of the cluster coefficient, lower integration, higher clustering, uh, high characteristic path length, sorry, and there are more information hubs because they, are, they show higher modularity in schizophrenia. And an example of multiple networks. In 2021, I proposed a method to build uh, multiplex networks when the interlinks between different uh, Frequency-based networks are not available using uh, canonical correlation analysis. Uh, I use uh, resting state EEG and we do the source reconstructions to have the signals in both uh, electrode level and source level. I use uh, the PLI, the phase lag index as connectivity metrics, and we compute the global strength that is the, the same as the mean no degree, the characteristic path length, and the cluster coefficient. And the procedure to multiplex, uh, we can see it in the, in the image. We take the control group signals and uh, we compute the connectivity in both uh, electrode level signals and in the source level using S Loretta, standardized S Loretta, to do the source location. And then we compute the network parameters in both uh, levels, and we use a canonical correlation analysis to define a plane where we are going to project the, the, these results to obtain just one value per subject. And with the rest of the groups, we do the source localization, we compute the connectivity and the network parameters, and project uh, these results into the plane defined by healthy controls. So we can compare our uh, healthy control groups uh, with the with the uh, other groups that, in particular, in this study, there were 
mi cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. And the results show that there is a lower integration in AD compared to healthy controls. Uh, the characteristic pack length grows uh, during the Alzheimer's disease continuum and a decrease in global segregation uh, as the disease progresses from healthy controls to severe AD. So we can uh, infer that dementia due to AD is characterized by a loss of a small world. So these networks are more vulnerable to attacks or to failures. And finally, a brief study that uh, does uh, network modeling is using the six uh, approaches or attacks that I have explained during the presentation to model the mechanisms that AD provoke in the brain of the patients. They have three databases, one uh, magnetoencephalography uh, recordings and the other two with EEG recordings. And the procedure starting with a preprocessing stage where they do the source reconstruction using Sloreta. They compute the orthogonal size uh, amplitude envelope correlation in each uh, classical EEG frequency band. The amplitude envelope correlation is just the correlation between the envelope of the signal in two channels. So it's only based on the amplitude, did not take care of the phase of the amplitude. Then they do the six uh, <coughs> sorry, attacks that I have explained before, primary, secondary, and random, to net to nodes and to pathways. And they quantify the network changes and evaluate the network robustness of the networks. And uh, the aim is to determine what happens in the different stages of AD uh, or what strategy uh, follows the the brain during the different stages of AD. And they show that the Alzheimer's disease continuum starts with a primary node attack that attacks to have vulnerability and they uh, infer some clinical uh, con conclusions about it. Then is followed by the random pathways attacks uh, that blur the structure of network distri weight distributions. And finally, there is they show that the more adequate uh, attack is a primary pathway attack that showing that uh, Alzheimer's disease alters local neural circuits in large scale, affecting on the integration of the networks. And that's all. I will be glad to answer your questions if you want to ask anything.